Good evening, everybody. Uh, tonight's speaker is Mr. David McDonough, and his title and topic, or topic and title I'm giving it, is What Relevance Has Hayek's Rotor Serfdom Today? Yes, yes that's what it is. Uh, Jan chose the title. I'll go along with it. Um, so, the, talking about the road to serfdom and uh, modern ideas, he has got a number of modern ideas in. He's got the uh, one chapter called uh, The End of Truth, and uh, you know, which is a fake news type thing, and uh, another called, uh, you know, Stephen Bain was uh, wrote me up uh, a, um, a couple of months ago and, and asked me what I thought of this. Uh, a guaranteed income thing which is going around and it's supposed to be something new. And I said it was de dead old, uh, you know, but I, I didn't expect to find it in the road to serfdom. But not only is, in the, is it in the road to serfdom, but um, Hayek, who by this time was uh, pretty tired of being a uh, lone wolf, as were, actually thought and actually says, quite fr uh, falsely as far as I can see, that uh, a guaranteed income. Uh, based on taxation, would be uh, would still be able to maintain individual liberty. Of course, that's <laughs> that's that's not coherent. <laughs> you know, if it's based on taxation, then it's got this uh, uh, in, uh, social liberty. But still, uh, th those are two those are two word titles uh, that he, that he has, uh, which are relevant uh, to uh, the, well, which are in the news this year, and will be in the news again, I suppose. Uh, now I think he, I think the whole fake news thing is uh, a bit of a storm in a teacup anyway. I think that uh, there's no way how human beings are going to get rid of the truth or uh, stop uh, using the, uh, tacitly of course, not explicitly. People get utterly confused when they, uh, if I was to ask any one of you, uh, apart from the philosophically trained, which there's a few actually here, yeah, uh, uh, to give me a definition of truth, you might stumble over it verbally, the explicit, but your, your tacit uh, understanding of truth um, will be perfectly all right. And uh, when, you, when you are actually given uh, an idea, a verbal uh, idea of the meaning of truth, you'll think it's trivial, utterly trivial. It says nothing. You know, uh, I can remember when... Uh, my friend introduced me to Tarski's theory of truth ages ago, back in around about 68 or so. And um, he said, I've just discovered the proper definition of truth. And uh, it is Tarski's theory of truth. And uh, I, I said, that roughly, I had the sort of outlook I have now on this matter. Do we need one? There's no problem with truth. Um, but then he, uh, he brought out this definition of truth. And I thought, well, that says nothing. It says absolutely nothing. Of course, he does say nothing. You know, Aristotle came up with it first of all, you know, to say what is, uh, that it is, and to say what it is not, that it is not. That is uh, the truth. And falsehood is to say what uh, is not, that it is. Um, well, of course, that's, it says very little. And um, our papa himself did have, uh, did, I think to his discredit, take uh, the uh, problems that people have come up with formulating a theory of truth quite seriously, and uh, it was Tarski that, um, that actually gave a, a formulation that solved these problems that Popper had in mind. Um, and uh, so uh, he uh, then re returned to what could roughly be called the correspondence uh, theory of truth. Um, well, I think that truth is a tacit thing. Uh, you know, I think I agree with John Locke in contradistinction to Popper, actually. Uh, John Locke said, um, uh, now of course I don't agree that, uh, with the theology of this, but I agree with the, the meaning, the semantics of this. Um, John Locke said, God didn't leave it to Aristotle to teach men logic. And basically what he means is there is that uh, logic is biological. You know, Aristotle was keen on biology, the biologist. Uh, logic is part of you know, is, is is innate, and uh, you know it's, it's part of human nature and so on. That uh, you know man is a rational animal. Aristotle said. I think that's perfectly correct. Um, so I think the uh, fake news or the end of truth thing is um, a bit thin. But again, Hayek actually tries to defend it. He thinks that uh, 
propagandists, uh, especially if they have a monopoly, can get people to uh, believe almost anything. Um, I think that this is, I'm very skeptical about this. Um, first of all, I think that most people uh, don't pay any attention to the media anyway. Uh, and uh, truth is, is not, they're not dependent upon the media for truth. Uh, but just like uh, there are some scientists, there's a, a scientist called uh, Lewis Walpole who actually thinks that science is the source of truth. Well, this is to overrate science. Truth is far older than science. And uh, science, of course, does use truth, although a lot of scientists uh, uh, go through exercises of, uh, of abandoning truth, sometimes, especially logicians. And other scientists uh, go through various exercises like that. And of course, that's, it's all harmless stuff as far as I can see. But uh, I can predict that they're not going to uh, get rid of truth in their everyday life. And uh, you know, truth is not at risk. Of course, as soon as I've said this, I've, I've put myself at odds with both Popper and Ayak, who actually tend to think that reason is uh, something to do with culture, and that uh, reason can't be yeah, uh, to quote the title of a book written by Roger Pig of at Warwick University, Reality Can Be at Risk. His book is called Reality at Risk. Uh, I don't think reality is that this can be at risk. Uh, and uh, I think it's a storm in a teacup. But Hayek actually does say that uh, even a clever person, if he's got no other source of income, uh, other source of information rather, if he's got no other source of information, he may well be foxed by a clever propagandist. Um, and um, of course, uh, we have this thing currently about this uh, uh, Cambridge Analytics and uh, the uh, Facebook and using the name and convincing people to vote, uh, and so on and so forth. I would be very sceptical that they had much in impact on the, uh, on the result of any election, either Trump or Brexit or the last election, British election, or any other election. Uh, but certainly, uh, uh, I think that, uh, uh, of course, uh, this brings me on to actually advertising. Uh, I don't think that uh, advertising, uh, because that's what it more or less is, it's targeted advertising, the, Facebook, uh, the Facebook thing. I don't think advertising ever persuades. Uh, I think uh, what advertising does is it sells things that are, are, have already been uh, subject to successful entrepreneurship. And it's the entrepreneurship that, uh, that, that makes the profit. It's the, it's the guessing of what, what's going to sell and the successful guessing of what's going to sell, the successful guessing of, uh, 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 of, what, of either what the public wants already or what they will want, uh, that will sell a good. Now, Gal Braith, uh, who uh, took the opposite view to this, he thought that advertising could sell any good. Well, uh, I think that that's naive, to say the least. Uh, there's plenty of goods that uh, uh, people will just not buy. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and uh, no amount of advertising will, do, will, will have much of, a, uh, of, of an effect on... on you know, they need to be goods. Are, are, uh, are aimed at the market mainly by entrepreneurs, and they mainly most of the selling is in the entrepreneurship rather than just the advertising. All the advertisement does is bring a bell and draw attention, and of course, it, it pays, advertising does pay, because this is uh, worth the price of advertising, even the uh, high price of advertising. It's worth it to draw attention, it's worth it for the LA for something, it's worth it for the LA to have advertised this meeting better, because we must have got a full, we must have filled this room if we'd advertised it very well. If we'd advertised it very well in London. I think bribery would be necessary. <laughs> no, I mean, they, might, they probably wouldn't, they probably wouldn't have come if they knew they were, they were getting, but, you know, they didn't. We're talking about a talk on the road to serfdom. But not, I mean, really, I mean, they don't know me from Adam, so... Then they'd probably come along just for the talk on the road to certain. If they all knew it was me, then probably they wouldn't, probably would only get probably we've got our full maximum now. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so, uh, but anyway, uh, so the the fake fake uh, truthy, and then this other, this other thing, uh, I think I could just at, uh, at that time because I deal with this more next week when I deal with the life and uh, uh, and the ideas of uh, of Ayak in, uh, in Stevenage. Uh, I think he was just, you know, cheesed off with this. He was about the only person at the London School of Economics, 
He was the, the only person who understood the economics that, uh, that, that was still not a Keynesian. And at the beginning of the uh, decade, around about 1931, all the London schools of economics were anti Keynes. They'd been primed to be anti Keynes by Cannon, who had just um, retired uh, just a few years earlier, who was anti Keynes all his life, although he's much older man than Keynes. Uh, he, he liked Keynes, but he, he liked pulling his leg. And of course, that's before Keynes became Keynes. <laughs> yeah, so, and Cannon was, well, Cannon was especially against uh, Marshall. And the reason why he was against Marshall, because Marshall tried to do a consolidation of the, of, uh, of the marginalist uh, revolution in economics and classical economics and labour theory of value. And uh, Jevons thought that this was ridiculous. Uh, Wicks D thought it was ridiculous. And Cannon, who was a follower of Jevons and an admirer of Wicks D, uh, thought that it was absolutely ridiculous. It, you, know, you should chuck out the labour theory of value and just push forward marginal theory. So that's basically why he was against Marshall. And then Keynes uh, was the Marshall's uh, 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 his, his pupil. And so he was against Keynes, but he, he wasn't against Keynes on a, or Marshall on a personal level. Uh, you know, he, he got on with them all, right? But he was against them ideologically uh, on the marginal theory. Now, um, so the whole of the London School of Economics was against, set against Cambridge, but um, Keynes was a very persuasive chap, and uh, he did win them all over, apart from Hayek, by about 1940. And um, so Hayek was. You know, uh, more or less isolated, and uh, I think this is the reason why he, uh, you know, in 1943, 44, when he came to release his book, and the, the this, this rather silly idea of uh, a guaranteed income uh, came up, that I said that it's no threat to liberty, that it's fully compatible with liberty, which of course I think it's not, and I think it's a bad idea. I think it would. Uh, 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 remove incentives for people. A lot of people do a lot less than what they do do if you didn't have this. And I do think that uh, Hayek, uh, more broadly, thought that it was quite right and quite humane to have a safety net or a dole. Now, I think the market doesn't need a safety net or a dole, and if you do have a safety net or a dole, it will mess the market up. Your uh, well, how, how then can you get a job, another job if you uh, get sacked or if you, you fall out with your, uh, the firm or something uh, and you want to get another job off your old back, you want to get rid of the firm and get another firm? Well, I think uh, the answer is there's a cleared market, and it would be a cleared market without a doll, would be exactly like it was in the 1960s where I myself uh, fell out with a firm and uh, I picked up the phone and uh, I got uh, one job, and then I picked up the phone again, and I got another job, and I had three jobs, and I thought, well, I'll go to the, I'll go to the nearest one. <laughs> and this is what it was like, that cleared market, it means that the jobs are chasing the workers. There's always a shortage of, 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 uh, of labour. And this is, this is perennial, as, as uh, Simon makes quite clear. You know, uh, the, the, uh, no matter how fast population grows, and Simon didn't deal with this, but no matter how fast artificial intelligence uh, of any sort is innovated, uh, you'll find that uh, the expert output will just make the potential jobs out there more viable and people will find that the jobs are chasing the workers in a cleared market, a cleared labour market. The only thing that will stop such a thing is an uncleared labour market. Now, when, when you provide a doll, you, you give people... Uh, uh, I mean, they don't know... They don't necessarily know uh, much about economics or much about the... And, they, and they, they, they have an incentive to have a rest and to uh, look around and to take time. That means that you, you accumulate mass unemployment. Now, as soon as you've got mass unemployment, you've got the labour market messed up. And I'm afraid the employers don't know enough about what they're about. And they think, that they, get, they start getting choosy and so on, and start saying, you, you know, if you want to sell newspapers for me, you need a university degree. Yeah. You want to solve the economist at the weekend, you need a PhD. Yeah. I mean, they start getting fussy. Uh, all, all this would go, all this fussiness about examinations and barriers to entry would go if you had a cleared labour market. And you can only have a cleared labour market if you haven't got a safety net. And so I think Hyatt was wrong on that. Uh, now, oddly enough, these are, now, I come to the main thesis of the book now, The Road to Serfdom. 
I think his thesis is exactly right, except that I would like to extend it a bit more. His thesis is that, uh, first of all, he thinks that uh, most people think that uh, Nazism is a reaction against socialism, the capitalist reaction against socialism. He says, no, that's false. Nazism is just socialism, socialism in one country. But Stalin actually uh, put it out that uh, you should always call the uh, Hitlerites, German fascists never call them Nazis or National Socialists, because it might uh, make it too obvious that there's some link towards my policy of socialism in one country. And uh, so uh, uh, you, know, you, can, you can see the development of these ideas. Uh, Mussolini was a uh, first-rate Marxist before the First World War. And uh, during the war, uh, for one, some, one reason or another, he started going nationalist. Now, why it deals with this, basically, when you, when you start trying to put this at you, while it's ideological, you've got, uh, you think in terms of world socialism, the world, internationalism, you know, we're, we're all brothers and so on. And, um, of course, Ayak also points out that there is anyway two, to two sorts of socialism. There is the, the socialism as a rival to capitalism, a new system, a new society. This is ideological socialism, uh, really pushed by small little groups like, say, Trotsky groups. And then there is the the general idea of socialism as an ideal, which large parties like the Labour Party and Labour voters might say, I'm a socialist. Of course, they don't know anything about it. You know, it never dawns on them that they're going to uh, replace capitalism. They, haven't, they might not even uh, have a clear idea of what capitalism is anyway. Uh, they just think that politics can make the world a bit better. And um, you know, uh, certain reforms might be good. And uh, if you've seen a social, socialist, I mean, socialism is just a nice word anyway. <laughs> what could be nicer than being social and socialist and so on? It is. Yeah. And I, I do think, I, I mean, I, I do, in all my conversations, if I'm writing to the internet, I think, I do save the word social. I mean, Hayek himself got cheesed off with the word social. And he, he thought it was like, sort of like an expletive. And, the, the, and eventually, when he started looking at social justice in a later book than this, his last book in three volumes, uh, Law, Legislation and Liberty, he started thinking that social justice meant, social meant knowing that, so social justice meant no justice. <laughs> I mean, that's a, a good joke, but uh, <laughs> I think that's, uh, uh, and uh, I think social is, is worth, I think is worth rescuing, just like I think, and here I can with me, I think the word liberal is worth rescuing as well. The pristine liberal idea is, of course, the complete social liberty, which is, uh, I mean, might as well define these two things. I think we have we have individual liberty, which Hobbes was right on, but this means that people can do what they want, and of course they pay the price for it. I could murder someone; that wouldn't that wouldn't uh, interfere with my individual liberty. It'd interfere with his liberty or her liberty. If it was a she who got murdered. Uh, it wouldn't interfere with my actual individual liberty, uh, and it means I can do what I like, and I pay the price. And so, if, if Ob says, if, if I'm attacked on the road by, uh, uh, and put under duress by free men, say, this doesn't, the duress doesn't rob me of my freedom. I can still react one way or the other to these free men. Uh, I may submit to them or run away or try and fight them in some sort of way. I'm still free. I've still got my. So, nothing, on, on this definition of, of, of individual liberty, which is not the liberal idea, <laughs> it is the, like the law of nature. We're all free, and we're all bound to be free. Now, we know this, but we all know this instinctively with the terrorist, terrorist problem. We know that a single terrorist, we know that either one of us, actually, we really want to uh, put our mind to it and make things awkward for the, for the general population, like bombing them and so on and so forth. Uh, we could do so, and that we'd make a complete mess of ourselves, and if we were clever, uh, the authorities might not catch us uh, for some time, and we might tr create a havoc. And we might, we might even get away with it completely if we're clever enough. Uh, depending on how long we create this havoc, become a terrorist. Um, so we know that individual, the individual can, uh, is capable of doing quite frightful things. And Hobbes did think, of course, that his, his anarchy was a war of all against all. Now, I think that's ex exactly wrong, because Hobbes did say that what cured this anarchy was government, which made a sort of society 
and made a sort of peace. Now, um, I think that's exactly wrong because I think that uh, a state of anarchy would be far more like Hobbes had it, where you'd have some sort of uh, natural law, natural logic. Uh, so, some sort of, like Locke I said, like Locke had it, where you'd have natural law, uh, uh, and uh, people, generally speaking, wouldn't very often be in conflict with each other. And um, now both Locke and Hobbes thought that the state made things better. But I tend to think, in my witness, that uh, the state tends to make things worse. I think politics is Cold War. I think politics is the war of all against all. And I think that was introduced by the state. So in that sense, I think Hobbes got it exactly wrong. It was the state that introduced this war. Because even if we just vote, now I've often said that a vote is not like a punch in the face, it's more like a smack across the face. It isn't doing much practice to another person. But it is going against another person. If I vote, I'm voting against other people. Anything else I do politically is against other people. So politics is the, the realm of the antisocial. Uh, and of course, not only is it the realm of the antisocial in the Cold War, but it's also intrinsically wasteful and uneconomic because it's a uh, uh, negative sum. In other words, uh, any form of politics will uh, cost more in inputs than it than will ever get in outputs. In sharp contrast to the market or, or to free association, uh, uh, which may, might not be uh, by cash nexus on the market, might be just free association, um, uh, that is very often, economic will get more out of it if I go to meet my friend and we have a game of chess. I may enjoy it far more uh, than if I did, didn't go and have that game of chess. And the, uh, the money it cost me to go and visit him on the bus, uh, and the few cup of tea we had, and so on, all that's chicken feed in, in comparison with the, 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 the boom of the meeting in the game of chess and, so, and the comradeship, and so on. And so that's free association. But then on the market, if I paid, I buy a Mars bar uh, for a certain amount of money. I'm afraid I don't know how so long since I bought a mask, but I don't know how much they cost. But say for I buy a, uh, come to something that I, I do know something about. If I buy a Guinness for uh, two thousand, two thousand. <laughs> if I buy a Guinness for two pounds fifty, which I have done just in the last hour or so, uh, then I only buy this Guinness for two pounds fifty because it's worth more than two pounds fifty to me. They only sell it to me because it's because the two pounds fifty is worth more to them. So this is a positive sum game, or a win-win situation, as they often call it. Uh, whereas the politics is a lose-lose situation. Now, most common sense, George Orwell, and common sense, and George Orwell, who is going to come up again in this talk, because him and another person called D. H. Carr, who Hayek mentions, uh, that, uh, Orwell thought that arithmetic applied to everything. He says, I know that one and one makes two. Now, one and one makes two is zero sum, neither negative sum or positive sum. So when we go on to game theory and we go on to, or we go on to certain algebras which are positive sum or negative sum, we're leaving arithmetic behind, and many algebras do leave arithmetic behind. And there are rules of arithmetic that doesn't apply to all algebras. So, um, so uh, Orwell thought that everything was one and one makes two. Well, it's not the, the market is not one and one makes two. It is a positive sum game where we get, it's economic, we get, we get more out than what we put in. Whereas politics is the opposite. Uh, we get, uh, politics has to tax people, and in taxation we put more in than we ever get out. Uh, so now this is, a, this is the case where the, you know, there is a, I mean the Libertarian Alliance is a, an alliance between anarcho-liberals and classical liberals, and the classical liberals feel that we must have a state, and the anarcho-liberals think that we can get rid of the state. Now, whoever's right on that, uh, politics is uh, negative sum anyway. You know, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't alter. Uh, you know, if you've got to have politics, it doesn't alter the economics of politics. It just means we have to put up with them. Uh, and, 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 we, and we can't make, we can't have a situation where we've, we, we're able to put this negative sum burden to one side. Or if the anarchists are right, then we can have a situation, in the, presumably in the distant future, where we'll be able to put this negative burden to one side. Uh, so anyway, the thesis of the Hayek book is that our ideals, and especially our socialist ideals, 
are leading to tyranny. To master, and I think this, this thesis is absolutely right. And um, our friend David Steele wrote a book called Orwell, Your Orwell last, last year. And he had a thesis of this book, um, a thesis that Orwell overlooked. Because Orwell, uh, Orwell was part of the, the, the movement that uh, Hayek was criticising, part of the socialist movement. And so was E.H. Carr. And these had the idea that it was inevitable that we're going to have more and more socialism as we go, go on, and the state will just take over more and more. And, and this was the way out, owing to victories of, the, of that very clever society, the Fabian society, this is the way how things looked to, to a lot of people. Uh, but I have points out in this book that uh, there's nothing inevitable in, uh, in uh, uh, more state regulation and more uh, 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 socialism, if you call socialism that state regulation and political regulation. It's just that we want it, so we, we're going along with it because this is what we choose, although we might not consciously choose it. I mean, Orwell didn't particularly like it. Carr loved it and wanted to bring it on. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, other, Orwell tended to dread it. But the thesis of David's book was just that socialism uh, will not get along with democracy very well in the long run. And that's exactly the thesis of this book as well. Socialism will have to get rid of democracy. Now, uh, there is a sense in which democracy is part of politics, and as I said just earlier on, I'm going to extend that thesis because I'm not just going to talk about socialism. I'm going to talk about politics, any political ideal. Politics itself, the sort of stuff that Mrs May and her opponent, Jeremy Corbyn, are talking about and thinking about, and the thoughts that they're, and the thoughts that, sort of things that the Opponents in their party, the opponents of Mrs May in the Conservative Party, the opponents of Mr Corbyn in the Labour Party. All of those ideals are, as I've said already, uh, negative some. All of them are going to make things worse. And indulging in that sort of activity with these people... I mean, if you could pay these people to go out and play golf or something, or go on a, a, a world cruise, I would uh, double their... You know, it'd be worth extra taxation. <laughs> you know, we want them to do nothing... We, and we want them to think of doing nothing. Uh, but they keep thinking of doing more and more things. Um, you know, they're going to, I've read in the paper today, they're going to uh, reinforce gay rights. Uh, well, uh, you know, a lot of these ideas are not too bad, but the point is it's too much on the whole. It's a bit like the, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, you know, I, um, I used to... Um, I used to take some girls out and, and offer to buy them fish and chips. <laughs> and, uh, you know, some of the girls that I took out, you know, didn't want any fish and chips, but they used to say, well, you can have some fish and chips if you want. I said, oh, thanks. <laughs> so, you have some fish and chips. But the point is, is that, the point here that I'm trying to make, I mean, with this example is this. There are sometimes some options that no one wants. You know, she might not have wanted fish and chips on that night. I might not have wanted fish and chips either. In other words, the, the whole option of fish and chips would be something that uh, might be worthy of consideration, but it might be worthy of dumping. But you know, what, what we get with politics is they, they think of all these things, these, all, all these various things, some of them are probably all right in themselves, they sound all right, but they dump them on the whole population. So every last man jack of us has to um, be concerned about what, you know, these few people now who, who can't make up, you know, they're, probably they're born in Middlesex, you know, and they can't make up their mind which sex they are. The whole of the population are now having to think about it. Now, presumably these people, you know, some of these people may well desire, um, deserve some care and attention. But for the whole, you know, it's, it's, it's the tail wagging the dog with, with politics all the time. Everybody has got to go in for this agenda. And this agenda is, is, is uh, zero sum, uh, negative sum anyway. And um, so it's costly anyway. And uh, it's, it's, it's probably... Um, it's probably not worth doing. And yet, yet we're just going to go on and waste, waste money on, on, on these projects. So I think the, the whole of political ideal is, is, is uh, uh, going to burden ourselves with our ideals. Uh, but I just think that it's socialism. Now, he's right, I think, that uh, uh, he thinks there's two stages. He thinks there's a stage before the war where uh, people were more idealistic. And then, uh, uh, but then when it came to actually organising, they found that they had to more or less organise on a national basis. It's hard work in the whole, all the countries, all the countries in the world, 
you know, it's, it's very hard. So you, you, so you have the British road to, so to socialism, the German road to socialism, the Italian road to socialism. Now, that breeds institutions, that breeds, um, as I quite rightly point out, breeds uh, uh, lower expectations and, and, and more nasty stuff. Uh, you, you go along a bit democratic, but then uh, you find that uh, you, you're trying to push these things through Parliament. And uh, as uh, Lasky found at the London School of Economics in the 40s, that uh, Hayek uh, illustrates, uh, uh, the Parliament's not capable of dealing with all these bills, so you've got to have delegated legislation. And even the delegated legislation is not capable of pushing through all these plans. And so Lasky comes out, Parliament is an obstacle to socialism. And there you have your, you know, your, 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 the socialism going against democracy. So your limited form of democracy is now no longer tolerated. And, and, and you go in for uh, an absence of democracy. You know, uh, and it boils down, oddly enough, although it's supposed to be a mass movement, it boils down to this odd chap, uh, you know, Lenin and Stalin in Russia, Hitler in Germany, Mao Zedong in... And when Mao died, and how can we find a replacement for him? <laughs> Biggest population in the world. <laughs> One man's dead. Oh, <laughs> how, are we, how, are we going to, how are we going to replace him? Oh, <laughs> but, 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 uh, and this is, it, it, the collectivism boils down to one man, <laughs> which is an irony in itself. But all of this problems of our liberty. Uh, as um, I said, you know, they even start planning our holidays. You know, they, they plan where we work. They, you know, uh, the ideal is that everyone should be employed by the state, the state should fix wages, uh, the state should organise your holiday time, uh, you, you can't uh, all go to Bogdan Regis because uh, you know, that has to be organised by the central plan. Uh, we lose liberty. So, you know, socialism uh, or our ideals or politics themselves is the road to serfdom and it needs to be resisted. We need to, as Mrs Thatcher tried to do, we need to roll back the state. And uh, the uh, best way to roll back the state is to cut taxes as much as possible and, and roll it back and, and increase freedom rather than decrease freedom. Uh, and I think that that is a, a message which is as, as poignant today as it ever was. Um, and, uh, but as I say, there are some, some things, surprising things in the Hayek book which, um, which are topical like uh, guaranteed income and... Uh, the uh, false truth, and I think I sadly takes the wrong line on both of those topics. You know, he thinks that the truth is at stake, and uh, that uh, it, 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 we can have a guaranteed income and still maintain liberty, which I think is false. So with that, I'll open it for, up for discussion. If I remember. Very good. I have to take advantage of my position as chairman and ask the first question. Do you think it's true to say that the worst always rise to the top? Oh, that's what Hayek said. His chapter on that is, is a, a bit weak, but he, he starts off by quoting Acton, which I think is wonderful. All power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. I do think that power corrupts, uh, and I think power corrupts whenever it emerges. Now, it can emerge very, very minutely on the individual level. For example, a bully in the school uh, playground has got power. He hasn't got much power. And he hasn't got any social power, but he's just got a little bit of power that he, 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 he's probably a bit stronger than most of the other boys. Now, I think that um, if one of these boys, even if it's a little boy, punches him on the nose, I think he'll, the bully will be shocked. And he may well steal himself up and fight and win, but he'll be absolutely shocked. And in that shock and in the surprise, he will see his own corruption and his own corruption of unfitness to fight getting his way by just, by not fighting, but just throwing his weight around, has come from the corruption of, of even the, the little power that a bully has in a, in a school playground. Now, I think when you come to organisations, um, and uh, I, uh, I tries to illustrate it in the chapter uh, that the, the most evil men rise to the top, um, you do get a, a situation where uh, someone who starts as a, as, as a democratic socialist comes to some dilemma that Lasky more or less uh, scotched there in what I said earlier on, uh, where you can't go ahead, democracy, so the, the soft-hearted socialists might say, well, all right, then we'll, we'll just go easy on it and we'll, we'll preserve our democracy. Whereas the more loudish will say, get out of the way, I'm, we're going to push ahead and 
never mind democracy, that can go. But I would say the loudest person there is likely to be a less nice person than the, than the, than the person who's true to democracy. Even though the person who's true to democracy might be more savage uh, when, when you compare him to a non-democrat who's not interested in democracy. Yeah. So I think the, you know, the so I do think I think there is something in there's something in power corrupts, uh, uh, and um, you know, it's best not to have any power at all if you, if you can if you can dodge it. I mean Einstein was dead against power and authority. You know, in his teens, Einstein uh, wanted to avoid power completely and utterly. But of course he failed. That's one thing where I beat Einstein on. <laughs> so I made the same resolution in my teens. Of course, I was totally successful at that. <laughs> no authority whatsoever. Mark the back there. Um, thank you for your talk, uh, David. Oh, you're uh, welcome. I, I, I think it, it should be better advertised. I think it should have a map included as well. Because uh, how nice I spent 20 minutes running around the university grounds trying to find this place. There was a map on the uh, website, I think, the meetup site. Uh, I think it was my Google app. No, it's okay, the meetup site was there. Um, you, you mentioned Thatcher, you touched on Thatcher. Yes, you she, she wanted to roll back the state. Back the state. Now, I think that she was supposed to have read Hayek, the road to serfdom, or she possibly met him, or people were trying to arrange her to meet him. I don't know how much influence, but she said she's quoted it as, as having read Hayek or being influenced by the road to serfdom. Um, and though, you know, she did try, or the, or the Tory government did try to introduce uh, some rollback of the state, as you mentioned. Really? I'm unpop popular and have these massive U band U turn. Uh, <laughs> apparently, Nick, Nick Ridley used to uh, sit, in the, sit in the cabinet and say, well, When are we going to get some of these cuts that we keep on getting criticised for? Because we're not. Um, but I think, uh, as Richard Wellings here mentioned a, a while back, that there, there aren't that many politicians who are sound in this country. So, can you think of any that are, that are sound? Even I guess some that are sound economically. Uh, well, you might get some of the sound from our point of view, from our perspective. Well, well they'll be voting, you know, uh, like the uh, people who are in favour of Brexit, say, uh, who are uh, members of the European Parliament, say we're like Turkey's voting for Christmas. Any politician in, uh, who, who was completely libertarian would be um, anti politics, would be like a, a Turkey voting for Christmas. Uh, because if you, have, if you cut taxes, keep cutting taxes, eventually you'll have fewer politicians and then eventually you'll have no politicians at all <laughs> if it goes all the way. So um, so really, it's, uh, it's really, uh, uh, there's a fellow called Steve Baker who uh, came to uh, Sean's LA meetings and uh, when uh, we uh, made up, you know, um, Sean invited us to uh, his meetings, I met Steve Baker and he offered to give us a talk and um, so I said, well, that's very good. Uh, and uh, I asked him if he'd give us a talk and he says, uh, he implied, you must realise that uh, there's more important business going on in Parliament for, than for me to give you a talk. Well, of course, that's, I wasn't at all surprised by that. That's exactly what you'd expect from any, anyone who, who, who went into the House of Commons. They'd think that politics was more important than the talk, than the talk to the LA, especially when the LA is basically an anti-political position. But is it lobby groups or is it just, like you say, power corrupts? Because I can think of wrong politician, Ron Paul, who said he's got no problem with that again. He actually said, "Well, yes, I actually have got no problem." And he oh. said, he's a constitution, but he did yeah. say, "Well, yes, I've actually got no problem with that." Oh yeah, well, there, there might be. I mean, I don't. I, I, I think that you can. I mean, Richard Cobden, for example, uh, w w was a member of the House of Commons, uh, and he loved the House of Commons. Uh, but basically, he, he, he uh, uh, although he loved the House of Commons, uh, he was basically a complete liberal. And um, he, although he did. He, he was wrong on state education. He did have a. Uh, he was a bit confused about state education. Uh, he thought the state the state was efficient. I mean, most of the classical. I mean, one of the people keep saying there's a difference between libertarianism and classical liberalism. I think that uh, I've illustrated in this conversation the, the one thing that uh, virtually no classical liberal would have uh, uh, illustrated, and that is the actual criticism of politics itself an anti-political position. I think that was alien to the classical liberals. Uh, people like Cobden, or people like Acton, uh, Gladstone, of course, um, all these people thought there was a wonderful role for politics and they thought the House was a wonderful thing, the House of Commons was a wonderful thing. And, uh, uh, but I think, he, to all intents and purposes, Cobden was 
uh, a non-ambitious politician, a completely unambitious. And when he was asked, when um, the uh, Irish chap, uh, who's, uh, he, uh, Lord, what, what's the chap who says, uh, you, you better not be found out that he's, he might have, uh, at the age of 83, he might have been pregnant as a young teenager. Oh, um, uh, Palmerston. Palmerston. When Palmerston um, uh, offered Cobden a place in the cabinet, Come and say this would make a, uh, a mockery of everything I've been saying. You know, you're a warmonger. This is a warmongering company. He calls itself liberal, but it's warmongering. I've been against war and I've been against the sort of policies that this government's been carrying out. So of course I won't take a place in the government. Well, most most members, most members of the House of Commons would never have said that. You know, uh, and he, he said, uh, he, Palmer said, said to come. Well, what are you doing here then? What are you doing in the House of Commons if you don't want to get on? And uh, Colin said, I'm here to spread a message for peace. You know, he's a pacifist. You read his writings, he's, he's clearly that the anti Corn Law League should have been called the Pacifist League. The object of appealing Corn Law was to institute peace. You know, the aim of it was to, get, to solve the problem of war, which, of course, is a big liberal ideal. And the other liberal, other liberal ideal is to solve the, the problem of mass unemployment. That's why I talked in such dark terms about mass unemployment earlier on. Yeah, that's the solution to mass unemployment. No safety net. And it's quite stark, but it, it'll work. And so, you know, so I don't like the starkness of it, but I like the fact that it'll work. <laughs> huh? Right at the back there? Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, about, uh, your comment about halts there. I mean, he specifically said in his famous quotation that uh, life in the state of nature yes. was poor and nasty. I, th I, I think yeah. he was against uh, ju just complete anarchy. Yes. And, and, and uh, that was what would happen in a complete state of nature. He said that everyone would be at each other's throats. Yeah. It would be yeah. a permanent war of all against all. Yeah. And I, I, I suspect he's right on that. Well, no, there's no reason why there should be a war of all against all. Um, you know, Locke's more like, you know, if you read Locke on the state of nature, that's more realistic. You know, there's no reason why people should uh, fight each other. Um, so, and there is a reason why they should uh, treat each other with a certain amount of respect. It's not perfect, and, and Locke did actually think that the state did make things better. Now, I think Locke heard there. However, I don't think the state of nature was perfect. And of course, uh, owing to uh, advances, uh, life is getting longer and longer. And, you know, uh, and of course, the, uh, the further back you go, the, the, uh, the shorter life is. Uh, but we're curing infant mortality uh, wonderfully well over the last 2,500 years. You know, now, infant mortality is still a problem. But it's not nearly the sort of problem it was 2,500 years ago. But if you've made it through this infant mortality, I mean, Plato, for example, 25 years ago, made it into his 90s and so on. So, uh, in the state of nature, it might, might be that some people made it into their 80s and 90s. Um, but I don't, think, I don't think there was a, um, uh, a war of all against all. I think the war of all against all only comes in with the state, with politics. The Cold War is politics. Get rid of politics and you've got rid of the... Uh, the institution that drives people against each other. Because that's what the state does, it drives people against each other. If you haven't got that uh, social incentive to go against other people, there's no reason why you, there may well be no reason why you should go against other people. I mean, there might be some reason why you could go against other people as well. But that's one thing, what you've got is an institution that certainly guarantees you a war of war against all, and that institution is the state. So Hobbes gets it exactly wrong, but nearer to the truth, as most people, would, most commentators would agree that Locke is more realistic on the state of nature than Hobbes is. You know, Hobbes would have to make a certain point. Even Hobbes might even agree that Locke's state of nature is more realistic than he is. Uh, because, as I said, Locke did think the state was an improvement. So Hobbes and Locke, I mean, to a large extent, the truth of the matter is, is that Locke was largely a follower of Hobbes, as were well a lot of other people. And uh, he just uh, revised Hobbes to some extent. 
Didn't Locke think the state mounted a not a lot more than courts of law to ensure that contracts were met and theft and robbery were deterred? Oh, he didn't want to, he didn't want an extensive state. I mean, but no one wanted an extensive state then because the state, see, the state wasn't concerned then with. Uh, I mean, the state has always been concerned with war. <laughs> you only have to walk up from uh, Falgus Square to the House of Commons and have a look at all at uh, what, what the statues are dedicated to, the dedicated generals. And, uh, the state is always concerned today, as ever, with war. Now, until the rise of the welfare state, uh, say about, you know, about 1870, or the ideas of the welfare state about 1870, or so, the state was naked about being about war, and welfare in the Middle Ages was something more to do with the church than with the state. When Henry the Eighth uh, sacked the monasteries, he destroyed a lot of welfare in this country. And those monasteries provided a lot of welfare. So the state was wasn't just. Well, the social contract is, a, is a, an hypothesis. It's not a, you know, no one, I mean, Hobbes didn't think and Locke didn't think and Rousseau didn't think, uh, any of the contract theorists didn't think there was an actual contract in the past that had been made. They said it's an as if, you know, it's a kind of like a, what they might call a model. Uh, you know, it's as if we got, it's, it's what I call a quasi contract, it's a, as if there was a sort of contract. Now this, this guy, I'm in a bit of an argument with Jan on this presently, which I haven't finished off completely. Uh, I don't even think that it's the analogy, I don't even think it's an analogy to an actual contract. I mean, the movement always was, as every man said, uh, uh, the progress of society went from status to contract, which is a, you know, a movement of liberty, because status, of course, is uh, where you know, it matters who I am, what matters to me, and so on. Uh, you know, if I'm uh, Sir David MacDonald or not, you know, or Lord MacDonald or whatever, you know, <laughs> none of those things, of course, no, but, but uh, uh, that's what matters, that's the status. Now, what I'm saying in this book is you're going from contract back to status with, with what you generally call socialism, or, or we could call politics. Yeah, you're going, because you, you, more and more of the, the things are being organised, so it matters who you are, what you've done, what your CV is, rather than, uh, I mean, CV, you know, the resume, they, they, they're a sign of moving away from contract to status. Who are you? What have you done? The status, not contract. But for liberty is contract, not status. Now, these were basically liberals, or they were influenced by the liberal idea. And so they had the idea of the social contract this contract was kind of like a nice idea. But I don't think it was a... I don't think there's much of an analogy between the social contract and an actual contract. But other people... Jan, for example, I suppose, might, might disagree on that. Any more? Well, one more for me. Is it not the case that justice is essentially and inevitably a social perception? Justice? Yes, oh yes, but I think, I think social is very good. I don't think social is state. No. Uh, but yes, I think uh, language is social, of course. Uh, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with social. Uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I can understand now getting a bit grumpy about it in his later life. And I think he's, and I say, I think he's substituting social for no when it's social justice in no justice. Justice, that's a good joke. But uh, uh, I, I think social is a, is a word worth fighting for, as is liberal. And uh, yes, uh, yes, language is social, justice is certainly social, yes. I'd say so, yeah. Well, yeah, but so manifestly so, you don't have to put the bloody word in, in the front. Uh, yes, oh, you, I think you're right, yeah. <laughs> Too true, yeah. With that, so clearism. With that intemperate remark, um, we adjourn to the bar. Thank you very much, David, for oh. an interesting talk. Oh. Oh, thanks for coming.